it's, it's there yep there we go okay um good evening everybody and thank you uh, for inviting me to give this presentation this evening um i'm going to be talking about a subject that perhaps uh, is fairly unfamiliar to a lot of you um even to most archaeologists, the Paleolithic, that is the period of time uh, before 10,000, 11,000 years ago, is fairly unfamiliar to most conventional archaeologists. And our archaeological record starts at the place that most <laughs> of you guys finish um, when you're looking for the natural. All our archaeology is in what um, normal archaeologists call the natural. So that's what I'm going to be talking about um tonight now i first saw the river thames when i was about five or six i think um when i uh, was taken to london by my parents and we went on a, a boat down the river and i can remember going underneath tower bridge and being quite mesmerized by the river and and the bridges and so forth and I, little did i expect at that point how much importance the river would play in my academic career and I've also spent 18 years living in London but working in and around the Thames and South East England throughout the period of time from about 1981 um, onwards so it's really nice to be able to talk to you um, about some of this work tonight. So what I'm going to talk about um, is a quite a wide-ranging um, series of subjects. I, I need to talk about the geological context of the archaeology for the Paleolithic, that is the old Stone Age, the, 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 the time from about a million years ago up until the start of the current warm period, the Holocene and the beginning of the Mesolithic, um, we need to understand the ge geological context of the archaeology because all of our archaeology, without exception almost, occurs within naturally deposited geological units. So without understanding the geology, we can't really begin to address the archaeology. I'll talk a little bit about the changing environments during the last one million years or so, the, the time period that we all commonly call the Ice Age, and the changing geography of that time period in the human past will be a common recurring theme throughout the talk. I'll say a little bit how we investigate the Paleolithic archaeological record, because again, that's going to be unfamiliar to the majority of you, I would imagine. Um, and then I will talk about some of the evidence that we have found um, in the sands and gravels of the River Thames sequences um, that span this nearly one million years of time. Now, clearly, I can't talk about every single site in the Thames uh, Basin. And what I'm going to do is largely talk about sites that I've been involved with um, excavating and uh, investigating. So it will be a bit of a, a, a mixed bag and we'll um, go through time from the oldest to the youngest. Um, and um, then I'll end up just giving you a few thoughts about where we are at the present time and uh, a few references if any of you have been suitably enthused by the, the talk to want to follow it up. So the River Thames today obviously flows um, through uh, Oxford, um, down to Reading, uh, through London and into the mouth of the Thames um, between Southend and the mouth of the Medway um, here. Geologically speaking, the bedrock consists of the green here, hope you can all see the cursor, um, and the green here, which is the, the North Downs and the Chiltern um, Hills running through here, which form the edges of what we call the London Basin. So it's like a saucer shaped um, feature with the older rocks here and here at the, the, the margins of the basin and younger rocks um, in the middle here. Um, these uh, pale uh, brown coloured things here are uh, deposits called the London clay and, and, and other um, deposits have been laid down in the last uh, 60 odd million years. Now, the importance of the bedrock geology for us as Paleolithic archaeologists is that it provides the sand and gravel, largely, that most of our deposits are in. And it also dictates what sort of environmental archaeological remains we might be expecting to find in the deposits associated with our stone tools. So um, sediments that are derived from the chalk or sit on the chalk may well preserve bones of large and small animals and, and mollusks, whereas the slightly more acidic uh, rocks of the um, tertiary in here in the central part of the London Basin might 
uh, better preserve uh, pollen um, and, and plant remains and less well preserve the, the animal bones and so forth. So that the bedrock is is, is both forming the, the sort of structural uh, underlying features on which the quaternary, that is the last uh, two and a half million years or so of, of Earth history is um, uh, deposited, and also it um, influences what is going to be preserved um, where. And this is quite important because we rely very heavily in Paleolithic archaeology on supporting paleoenvironmental remains to give us a, a, a picture of the environments. Now, don't worry about the complexity of this, this, this table here. This, this is a, a, a table that spans the last two million years up here. The top left-hand corner here, zero. This is the present time going back in millions of years down to 2.7 million years from the, from the top to the bottom. And what I want you to look at is this wiggly curve here that you can see this black line that's wiggling all over the place. Now, this is what we call the oxygen isotope stratigraphy. And I'm not gonna explain how it works, but the important thing for us to take away at this point is that there are spikes and troughs, spikes and troughs, spikes and troughs. And what this gives us is a picture of the change in climate over the last two and a half million years or so. So each one of these spikes here is a warm period. Each one of these troughs is a cold period. And you can see for at least the last half a million years or so, these spikes and troughs have a time span of about 100,000 years. So what this tells us is that the time span of the last million years from here up to here has seen the Earth's climate shifting between warmer and colder periods. So we have not one ice age, but we have a series of ice ages with warm, what we call interglacial environments, followed by a cold glacial environment, and then a swing back to warm environments and a swing back to cold. And so for our, the, the time span of human history in this country, which is about a million years, we have something of the order of eight or nine um, warm periods, similar to the present day, and then a similar number of cold periods at which um, the, the ice might well have expanded at certain times, and certainly the, the climate would have been much colder. But for most of the time, in each one of these cycles, the climate was not as warm as it is at present day or as cold, it was somewhere in the middle. So the majority of the, um, the history of human occupation is dominated by environments which are cooler and colder than they are at the present day, but not uh, one in which ice was everywhere. So perhaps thinking more like uh, conditions that we would encounter in um, Southern Scandinavia or someone like that characterizing most of the time. So just to zoom into the top part of that table, this is the bit that I'm interested in. This is the last 1 million years. Here are our peaks and troughs again. And our earliest archeological evidence um, in the uh, Greater Thames system is somewhere around here at about 0.9 to 1 million years ago. And so everything that I'm talking about is accommodated within these uh, 10 or so peaks and troughs that we see characterizing the climate of these uh, of this last uh, 1 million years. Now, moving to the um, what we call the superficial geology for the London Basin, that is the, the geology of the, um, the last million or so years, 2 million years, um, that is largely characterized by soft, unconsolidated um, sediments laid down during these warmer and colder periods. In the, the sort of London area, we can see three different colors of, of deposits here. In blue, what we call um, what's listed up here is Anglian glacial deposits, and I'll explain what those are in a minute. In pink here, what we call the pre-Anglian fluvial deposits. Fluvial means river, so these are um, river deposits laid down by the River Thames before this blue stuff was deposited. And then here in the brown, these are the fluvial, the river deposits of the modern River Thames. And, and to talk about this, I'll be splitting my talk into three. We'll be talking about what happened before the ice came down to London, what happened when the ice came to London, and what has happened after the ice came to London. 
just so you know what I'm talking about in terms of the sorts of sediments that we're um, likely to find um, in the London Thames area, the glacial sediments, that is sediments left behind by the ice, um, look a little bit like this. Um, this is what we call the chalky boulder clay um, in East Anglia. This is the debris left behind by the ice around half a million, 450,000 to half a million years ago um, in East Anglia. It's a mixture of chalk and clay and gravel. It's just dumped beneath the ice. Here's another form of, of glacial deposit. This is actually in Wales, but again, you can see this mixture of large and small cobbles, all the sort of debris left by the ice. So that's one type of sediment that we're likely to find in the, in the London Thames area. Um, and that's this blue stuff here. The pink and the brown, the river deposits, um, look more like this. So here we can see the sorts of sediments, this sand and gravel here in this channel form. This is the sort of material that would have been laid down by the River Thames um, during a cold period when there was lots of... Volume up on the audio. Um, on here, I should see if you can put the volume on. We'll get there in a second, don't worry. Um, so these sands and gravels are the sorts of deposits that would have been uh, formed during a cold climate when the um, River Thames was fast flowing and you had lots of spring melt from, from snow. Um, by comparison, these dark grey deposits from a, a cutting alongside the M25 in, at Averley, these are the sorts of sediments you might find during the warm interglacial periods, these organic um, sands and silts. And taken together, um, these are where we find predominantly our Paleolithic archaeology in the Thames Basin. So the sands, cold sands and gravels, this is a sort of environment we would expect to find a braided river channel. This is the sort of system you might find in Canada or, or, or um, uh, Norway washing out of a glacier. Um, by comparison, the, the organic silts from the interglacial that would be forming in a river like this. This isn't the Thames, this is the, um, the Avon just downstream of, of Bristol, but it's the same thing. And together, these deposits have been laid down by the river in a series of um, uh, sequences that form what we call river terraces. Now, I'll be talking quite a bit about river terraces because um, this is where the archaeology is. And this rather complicated picture, um, you don't need to, to really get the, the handle on the detail of it, but it's read from top to bottom, from going through time, from a, the beginning of an interglacial where this is the river floodplain here and it starts to lay down sands and gravels as it's getting warmer but it's still cold and it builds up a floodplain in this way and then as you go into a warm period like we're in the present time this Fordham River we start to see a single channel or a, or a couple of channels moving backwards and forwards across the floodplain this is the sort of environment humans would have um, lived in and then as it gets cold again the river starts to cut into those deposits. Um, <clears throat> it gets very cold and not much happens. And then it starts to warm up and the river cuts down into its bed, leaving this patch of gravel, these patches of gravel, high and dry above the floodplain that is now down, down here. So we get a series of steps in the landscape with older sediments higher up the slope gradually coming down the slope onto younger and younger sequences. And all of our archaeology is in, in these sequences. So this is an example of a river terrace sequence. It's not um, the um, in the Thames. This is in the Somme uh, near Amiens. Um, and you can see a cross section through one of these terraces. You can see the bedrock here, the chalky material, and you can see the sands and gravels laid up against it. So this is one of these terraces. I don't worry about the, the diagram up here. It's just to show you what these things actually look like in the field. We don't have very good exposures of these things um, in Britain, but they certainly do in, in, in France. So that's the sorts of deposits we find them in. How do we actually go about finding these, these sites? Because often these sites are deeply buried beneath the ground. Our, our, our sites can be buried anywhere between um, just beneath the topsoil to depths of 15 to 20 metres 
beneath the ground. And unlike later pre prehistoric and historic archaeology, where you can use things like magnetometers to find hearths uh, and walls and so forth, and you can see um, crop marks and upstanding features, Paleolithic sites don't provide any of those clues to um to, to to the archaeologists in order for them to um locate them beneath the ground and so most of our sites were found in the early part of the 20th century or the late 19th century during gravel extraction and quarrying where the quarries were dug by hand with the decrease in the number of quarries uh, at the present time the um these uh, discoveries are getting fewer and far between. And so we've got to, to, to resort to other methods to look for the sites beneath the ground. And there are ways we can do it. We can uh, undertake geophysical surveys. And here's one type of geophysical survey, which is um, uh, set out at the beach uh, near Haysborough, looking for um, river channels that archaeology might be buried um, in beneath the modern beach surface. So we can we can do some geophysics, but um, it's looking at the geology to try and spot those locations in the landscape where archeology span might be. We can drill holes here and here um, to get uh, cores out of the ground um, to interpret the geology. And if we're really lucky to find um, archeology span and, and, and I have been lucky enough in Jersey to actually drill some holes and recover um, flint artifacts from a, a late Paleolithic site um, in this fashion, but it's unusual. We can dig holes with JCBs um, through gravels and then sieve the gravels um, looking for artifacts. Poor old Gil here was spent a long time looking, looking for artifacts to no great avail um, in, in this particular um, location, but it can be a, a useful technique for picking up um, artifacts. Sometimes we strike it lucky. Um, here are some uh, test pits um, dug um, in uh, near Ebb's fleet uh, under the control of Wessex archaeology and you can see their step trenches down in, into the sands and gravels and each one of these is, is, a, is a flake that has been found. Sometimes we can uh, pull out uh, bone material here that's being excavated um, from one of these uh, test bits. So if you find a single flake in a test bit like that it's usually fairly um, good evidence that there's something close by. Sometimes we use quite large trenches um, I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the findings from the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Uh, and this is one of the trenches um, that we dug when we were um, prospecting on the site that became the Ebbsfleet International Station. Um, and uh, we were able to dig this trench and to draw all these sections and record uh, any flints and finds uh, that we got in this uh, in this fashion. But they are deep holes. Um, you know, some of these that's about five or six meters deep at the bottom there, so that they are large undertakings and, and they're not cheap to do this either. And ultimately, if we um, get lucky, then um, the, the, the final uh, stage of this work would be excavation. And you can see here um, some excavation of uh, Paleolithic stone tools. Again, this is um, on the site of the Ebbsfleet International Station or one of the roads adjacent to the to the station. And you can see um, all of these flags in here are um, locations of artifacts in the trenches um, of this particular um, site. Excavation of these sorts of um, sites is time consuming. The flints all have to be three dimensionally recorded. Um, and if they're thought to be um, in situ, in other words, um, left largely where they were by the people who uh, made the artifacts, however many hundreds of thousands of years ago. So it's a time consuming and slow business, the excavation. Okay, so that's how we do it. Um, uh, now I'm going to run, start running through time and go back um, to the earliest parts of the record, um, what we call the pre-Anglian times, to say splitting it into the pre-Anglian, the Anglian glaciation, which changed the geography, and then the post-Anglian times. So this is the sort of deposits that we're talking about um, in pre-Anglian times. These are all uh, sands and gravels laid down uh, by the River Thames. And right at the top here, this deposit here, you can see just beneath the trees here, this is um, the till, this is the debris left behind by the Anglian ice um, extending down to London uh, 450 odd thousand years ago. So 
all of the sand and gravel is underneath the um, the glacial uh, deposits. So the distribution of the sands and gravels that I'm talking about that predate the glacial ice sheets reaching London, this is their distribution. You can see them in this red dotted material here. You can see that they follow the modern Thames from Oxford to Reading and Maidenhead. But rather than continuing in an easterly direction to the lower Thames here, they then swing northwards. St Albans is about here. Um, up towards uh, Colchester, Chelmsford, and off to the north towards Norwich. And you can see where the, um, the modern day Thames is here, rivers like the Medway are actually flowing right away across what would now be the mouth of the Thames and, eastern, and into Eastern Essex. So this is a very different geography to, from the geography of the present time. There's another river system here, um, called the Protosaur, this is also known as the Bytham River, that comes across the Wash here. The Wash didn't exist. The River Severn down here didn't exist because this river is probably draining parts of the Welsh uplands through here. And this is the landscape into which our earliest ancestors came about, half a, mil uh, about a million years ago. At a closer level, when you zoom in, here's Oxford. Here's Reading, up towards uh, St Albans through here. Again, the detail of this isn't important, but what each one of these um, <clears throat> uh, uh, zones on the map here, these are individual river terraces of the, of the type I described earlier. Um, the oldest ones here, Westland Green, going down to younger and younger ones through here. And all of these are buried by the Anglian ice. So what this is telling us is that it's a very long record through central, uh, through the sort of central part of uh, southern England, up through the Vale of St Albans, and into East Anglia, of the River Thames, um, through this period before the um, Anglian glaciation, and we don't know how far back in time these goes, but they probably go back well before a million years ago. So these document the early course of the River Thames. Zooming out in scale. This is what the geography associated with that early Thames up towards Norfolk actually looked like. There was no English Channel. The Southern North Sea came down here. There was a, a, an embayment in the Southern North Sea. There was an embayment in the English Channel and you could walk from France to Britain. We, there was no sea between Britain and the continent, even during warm periods of high sea level as we're experiencing at the present day. So you could always walk into Britain at this particular time. And this is the geography of our earliest ancestors. So the first site I wanted to, to talk about is over here at Haysborough in um, Norfolk on the Norfolk Suffolk border. Um, this is despite its long distance from the Thames at the present time, this was in the uh, estuary mouth of this ancestral river system that ran up through the Vale of St Albans and into East, um, into East Anglia. So that is why I'm talking about it. It is in part of the Greater Thames before the Anglian Ice. And I'm talking about this time period down here, somewhere, be somewhere around 0.9 of a million years ago. We're not entirely sure. Um, but somewhere in that neck of the woods. Plus or minus 100,000 years um, back then is, is pretty accurate going, um, I'm afraid. The excavations were undertaken by the British Museum team and the Natural History Museum team um, between about 2005 and 2012. Um, here you can see some uh, pictures of the excavation and the deposits you're looking at here are the important deposits, these dark organic sediments infilling um, channels and floodplains of the river when it was near to its estuary mouth, the coast wasn't here, it was somewhere further offshore, um, and they're all buried beneath deposits of that Anglian glaciation about 450,000 years ago. So they're preserved underneath um, and underneath these uh, deposits uh, in the cliff. And this has been the focus of, uh, of the archaeological um, investigation. This is a little cross-section, a simplified cross-section. What we're interested here is this um, grey 
deposit here. This is a, a channel, an estuarine and river channel, um, cut into older deposits and buried by this blue stuff. This is the debris from the uh, ice advancing uh, to London. Um, and the sequence, this is what the bit I'm interested in here. Um, this is the sequence here. You can see a pollen diagram here, simplified pollen diagram here. The red is deciduous um, trees, mixed oak, woodland, that sort of thing. Um, the green is conif conifers, um, indicating cooler environments. And you can see that as the channel filled up, it went from a, a, a sort of predominantly uh, deciduous environment to a more uh, coniferous environment. Um, suggesting it was becoming cooler as the uh, channel filled in through here. These are the deposits in close-up, and you can see, uh, or part of the sequence in close-up, it's a very complicated sequence up here underneath the, uh, the cliffs. This is the Anglian glacial deposits you can see here. Um, so these are the tidal uh, estuarine channel sequences um, in part of that um, uh, channel with the archaeology. So the early phase, as I said, um, had uh, deciduous things, uh, then you uh, had a heathland, and then a final phase with the birch and the pine, um, and you can see some of the finds here, nice um, uh, pine cones here. This is part of a mammoth tooth. Uh, it, it's a, a very early form of mammoth, one of the earliest uh, types of mammoth. The insects from these deposits um, suggest summer temperatures as warm as today, but in winter temperatures about three degrees cooler. Um, and the, as I say, it, it's in the sort of mouth of this estuary. And these are the sorts of tools that have been found uh, in those deposits. Very simple um, flakes. These are all struck flakes. Um, <clears throat> Nothing more complex than that. They're all very sharp and fresh. They haven't gone anywhere. So we, we can be pretty certain that these are um, contemporary with the, the channel in which they were found in. If they were um, battered and blunted and um, abraded, then they might have been worked in from elsewhere. But the, these are, are as contemporary as we can uh, imagine from this channel. So these people were in this environment, somewhat similar to southern Scandinavia around about 900,000 years ago and at the moment this is our oldest archaeological evidence for humans in Britain at this time. Um, the other thing that um, is associated with um, these uh, um, early um, occupations are the um, footprints at Haysborough. This is the surface with the footprints on them, this sort of peculiarly uh, undulating surface. Um, from above, here's a photo mosaic, and you can see the individual footprints here. Here's one um, blown up. Uh, you can quite clearly see the toes there. Um, a unique snapshot of a group of individuals, from small children to, to uh, juveniles and, and adults, probably. Um, I can't remember quite how many they reckon are in this group. Um, <coughs> just stopped for a minute to do something and then passed on. Um, and these are the oldest human footprints in the world outside um, Africa. There's nothing else of um, this antiquity um, anywhere else in, in the world. So these, these are a, a very unique snapshot of these people um, about 900,000 years ago at the mouth of the Thames. So that's where they were. Up here, up at Haysborough, you've got the Thames coming up through here. There's a, a, a sudden embayment um, through there. Elsewhere, associated with this period of time before the, um, the glaciation um, buried these older deposits and got to London. Um, archaeological evidence is few and far between. Here's a, a couple of flakes from um, Westcliff High School for Girls, which is down here uh, near South End. Um, there are a few flakes from this particular gravel here, the Wivenhoe gravel um, and the Ardley gravel um, north of uh, Colchester. Um, there are other sites in East Anglia also associated with this early period, but very few in the Thames area, because, of course, the Thames through modern <clears throat> uh, through the modern valley didn't exist at, this, at the present time. So it, it would be hard pressed to find very much evidence for for this um, early human occupation in the main Thames Valley. <coughs> Glaciation of the of the Thames Basin to the London area occurred here around about 450,000 years ago in what we call um, isotope stage 12. You can see that 12, number 12 there. That's the, um, <clears throat> the number of this um, trough here. Um, so everything we'd been looking at before um, belongs to these stages 
um, down here. So the ice comes into the London area and buries everything um, north of London beneath these ice deposits. So here's a, a geographical map produced by Phil Gibbard that shows um, what that scenario might have been. Um, here you can see the ice front. Here's the modern Thames and the modern outline of, of, of Great Britain. Uh, the ice coming down to here may well have been a large um, lake in the southern North Sea, impounded behind the remnants of the ridge running from uh, France to England, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and this ice uh, dammed lake might have uh, burst on a number of occasions to start the creation of the Straits of Dover um, through here. And people like Sanjeev Gupta at the Imperial College have written extensively on this um, so-called um, catastrophic flows through the Straits of Dover, which, which started us on our uh, perilous uh, journey to Brexit. Um, more closely within the London region, this is the uh, one reconstruction of the ice front here, and you can see um, how it's coming down into the Vale of St Albans, it's coming down to Finchley, it's coming down to Hornchurch, and it's blocking this former course of the Thames, which went up through St Albans towards Colchester. The Thames can no longer flow there, and it's pushed into a series of um, valleys, probably valleys that existed that were originally flowing to the north, at uh, the northeast, the drainage is reversed into a southerly direction and the modern Thames drainage created through here. So zooming in even further here, you can see the, uh, the ice limit here through North London. Any of you that happen to live in Finchley, there's an end moraine, that is the, uh, the debris um, that accumulates at the snout of, a, of an ice sheet. Um, there's a Finchley moraine through here and it comes down to Hornchurch in Essex there. So it's burying this pre-existing um, uh, Thames to the north and it's creating the modern Thames Valley to the south. So the modern Thames Valley only has deposits in it um, that predate this glacial um, push to North London. So this is a map, again, complicated map. Don't need to worry about any of the details here, following the modern Thames through, through central London here. And these uh, different colored deposits here are the terraces of the River Thames that the River Thames has created as it's moved its way through the new um, the newly excavated valley after 450,000 years ago. And these different colors represent the different terraces um, of the River Thames. So as we move, say in this area, um, the Heathrow area, we move from um, the Lynch Hill, what's called the Lynch Hill Terrace here, to the Taplow Terrace here, to the Kempton Park Terrace. Again, terms that you don't need to worry about, but we're going from older to younger as we're moving towards the modern Thames. And so archaeology that we find associated with these different terraces can be placed into a relative chronology because we know the higher deposits in the valley are older, we can start to order our archaeology in this fashion. And, and until the advent of um, dating techniques um, that we use today, this was one of the prime ways we had of, of, of ordering our, our archaeology. We had no way of dating it. Radiocarbon dating only goes back to 40 odd thousand years. Um, so when we've got things that are 400,000 years old, it, it's difficult to date. So we've used the geology to help um, organize them. So our, our um, landscape has changed by this point. We're starting to see the sort of framework of Southern England coming out through here. We might still have a bit of a ridge at times um, in the Southern North Sea, but this will be periodically breached uh, by changing sea levels. So the geography is becoming more complex and it's evolving towards the modern uh, geography. In the Thames, Lower Thames, as I said, we have a series of river terraces. This is a uh, an idealized cross section through the Lower Thames showing the different terraces. You can see the names that are given to these terraces down through here. The higher ones are the oldest and the lower ones are the youngest. And the, the youngest ones are buried beneath the, 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 the modern <coughs> alluvium of the uh, river floodplain down through here. So again, Archaeology up here is older than archaeology here and so forth. It, we use this as a relative uh, chronology through here. 
So I'm going to talk um, about sites mainly down in this area here now, on the south bank of the Thames um, in uh, northwest Kent. <clears throat> it's not perhaps the most attractive part of the world. There's been a lot of he heavy quarrying in this area in the last hundred years, but it preserves possibly the best uh, sequence of uh, deposits for the last 400,000 years anywhere in, 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 in the UK. I haven't worked at Swanscombe, but we have to start with Swanscombe, which is um, a site um, on the uh, highest terrace, what we call the Boyne Hill Terrace, um, just downstream of the Dartford Bridge. It's a site that uh, forms our um, a sort of key marker for, for what was going on immediately after the last uh, the, the, the Anglian ice event 450,000 years ago. Today, the site is a national nature reserve. This was the site of a quarry until the 1960s. Um, it's got a long record, about uh, 15 metres or so of uh, sands and gravels that are preserved within the site. Um, again, we don't need to, 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 to remember the, um, the terminology, but we've got a, a lower gravel and something called the lower loam down here, then middle gravels and upper gravels. And people have worked on them since the early part of the 20th century. John Weimer from his archive here has worked um, extensively in the site, um, and it's been re-excavated on a number of occasions um, through to the present time. Here are some examples of, of John's um, records from the 1950s or uh, yeah, 1953 here, working um, in the in the quarry here, and this is part of the lower loam, um, which is an important body of of uh, deposits at the base of the sequence. Now, the sequence is so important because it, it, it provides uh, a template for, for what we think is going on elsewhere. So the bottom part of the sequence here um, has what uh, a series of artifacts that are typically um, flakes and cores of, of flint. And as we go up the profile into the middle gravels and, um, in particular, these are replaced by a series of pointed um, tools that we call hand axes or, or bifaces. Um, and there are differences of opinions as to what this represents. Some people think this um, represents um, different uh, ways in which people are making tools. Other people think it represent different groups um, with different tool making abilities. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but um, this is a pattern that we can see um, at a number of other places with these um, core and flake tools at the bottom and uh, being replaced by hand axes further up. So this is what we, we're referring to, um, core and flake tools um, that some uh, that are commonly uh, known as Clactonian after um, the site at Clacton on Sea, where these were first described um, in the early 20th century. And these are replaced up profile by these uh, pointed tools, the hand axes um, or the um, bifaces um, that we can see here. And some claim that at the top of the sequence, there are ovate bifaces, which replace the, the pointed bifaces, but that's, I, I believe, a contentious <coughs> issue at the moment. Swanscombe is also very important because it had provided um, one of the few sites to produce uh, hominid uh, rem remains from this time period. Um, it produced these three fragments of skull of a probable ancestor of um, Neanderthals, although the front of the, the, the skull is missing. Remarkably, these three fragments of skull were found um, on three separate occasions, separated, I think, by nearly 20 years in, in, in the case of two, two examples. Um, and so this, this, is, this is really um, rare. The only other site, um, Paleolithic site, um, of this comparable, well, this sort of age is at Boxgrove where a tibia and two teeth have been found, and that's probably a hundred thousand years older than this. Um, and then you've got um, sites like uh, uh, Pont Newydd Cave in North Wales and La Cote saint Bernard in Jersey, which have uh, Neanderthal teeth, and, and that's it before you get to modern humans. So a very important site. Um, moving on um, quickly, um, I'm going to talk about the Ebbsfleet Valley. The Ebbsfleet Valley um, is here in um, South London. I was talking about Swanscombe previously, which is here. The Ebbsfleet Valley is a small valley. It's, it's a trivially 
a, a trivial little um, backwater today. You wouldn't make much of it, um, but it re it contains a remarkable suite of, of Pleistocene deposits that have been worked upon for many years um, and were the, the focus of, of our work uh, associated with Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Here you can see the, the, the footprint of the, of the railway and some of our sites and previous sites that we worked upon here. Um, I'm going to talk about a site down here first, uh, very briefly, the, the, the South Fleet Road Elephant. Then I'll talk about um, a site in here and I'll end up speaking at the end of the talk about a site uh, down here. Uh, so here you can see some of our works um, during the construction phase of the rail link and the scale of some of those works. This is a simplified diagram. Um, very much like the one I showed you before of the Thames terraces. And here you've got the Ebbsfleet terraces with one set up here and a series down the valley side here. Um, this contains a, a really remarkable long record um, and it might tell us something about what we might expect to find in some of these other apparently insignificant um, Kentish um, valleys that might preserve important deposits like this buried at depth, which we're completely unaware of at the present time. The South Fleet Road elephant <coughs> was found um, down here. Um, this is the site. You can see it, it's actually, it's not very clear here, but it's actually only about uh, 15, 20 metres uh, across here, and it's about 200 metres long. It was actually um, sediment left underneath the road. Quarrying had uh, taken place on both sides um, up to the road, and um, the, the sediments were left underneath the road. and um, they decided to move the road and this became available and we were able to see see these these dark um sediments here these are lake deposits um from a lake that was um, built up in in this valley um, when the thames was flowing to the north about four hundred thousand years ago um and in those lake deposits these are the uh tusks of a straight tusked elephant the the head and the two front feet of the elephant were here. The body was bent round like this. This is the edge of the cut for the old quarry. So the back end of the elephant if, <coughs> would have gone out into this area here. So it had gone, um, you know, 100 years ago, whenever they quarried this particular um, area here. Um, so this is an elephant admired at the edge of a lake. Um, on the edge of the lake, a little bit further up slope from here. This is one of the trenches. These are um, individual artifacts. Um, these are all flakes and cores. There's no hand axes um, in, in this level at this particular site. So this is a um, what we'd call a clack, the Clactonian assemblage, like the lower part of Swanscombe. Um, a lot of these, um, this shows <coughs> the refitting of flints to each other. Um, it's a plan. Here's, here are the two tusks of the elephant. Here are the elephant bones. Here are all the uh, flint artifacts. <coughs> There's no scatter of... Uh, uh, tools in, in here um, and there are no cut marks on the elephant bones but um, it's quite common um, in this time period to find uh, human bone uh, the human artifacts and uh, uh, large elephant bones associated um, very rarely do you actually find um, cut marks on elephant bones but undoubtedly they are butchering uh, these beasts whether they killed it is another matter um, but the the, the the spatial distribution of the stone tools and the bones is is, is pretty conclusive um, in this case so that's uh, a 400,000 year old elephant butchered at the site um, the site is also historically important because of a, a quarry known as Baker's Hole, which was excavated um, in the early part of the 20th century that produced uh, Middle Stone Age, um, what we call the Valois artifacts. Um, and its context was rather poorly understood, but we got a chance um, to re-excavate some of the uh, deposits associated with that site during the excavation of the rail link. And here you can see some of the deposits. We were able to date these deposits, which was obviously not possible when the uh, assemblage was collected back in the early 20th century and we've dated these deposits to about 180,000 years ago so by um, by inference these what we call the Valois flakes and this is the um, this is the uh, sketch section from the early works and you can see it looks fairly similar to 
some of the stratigraphy that we're seeing um, in this um, in, in our excavations. So we, we can be quite uh, happy that we've probably dated these artifacts um, to around about 180,000 years ago, which is in a cold period, incidentally, and not in a warm period. Uh, and these are what some of the artifacts look like. These are Lavalois um, flakes. In the Thames, after all this activity between about 400,000 and about 200,000 years ago, people disappear. Um, we don't really have any evidence for people um, in the last interglacial. If you go to Trafalgar Square and dig a hole in Trafalgar Square, as I've done, um, you will find um, the bones, particularly of hippo, lots of hippo teeth, but uh, straight chest elephant, rhino, <coughs> lion and so forth. But no, no people. Um, it's commonly felt that um, people weren't here during the last interglacial. They were in northwestern France uh, at the mouth of the Somme Valley, but they <laughs> didn't cross the channel. Uh, maybe the sea was already there, they couldn't cross the channel. Um, we, we're not in, entirely sure. Um, when, pe when did people come back? Well, this is a contentious issue. We've got some evidence for what the environments were like after the last interglacial, and this is work that we undertook um, at the um, entrance to the crossrail uh, as it goes down into the underground section at Paddington at the Royal Oak Portal here. We excavated in advance with Oxford Archaeology on this back in about 2012, I think now. Um, these are the deposits. You can see the, the, the concrete retaining walls here. Uh, these are the deposits that we exposed. And it's what I'm after is this gray deposit in here. This is part of the river channel, a slow moving river channel that contained bones. This is um, uh, probably a, 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 a bison bone here. Um, it, the material from this channel, no stone artifacts, um, but we had lots of bison. This is a plan you can see. Um, th th these are all bison bones and these uh, diamonds and um, <clears throat> in the, the triangles here are, are reindeer bones and then a whole series of unidentifiable bones. These are in the river channel. Um, they're associated with pollen that uh, appears to be sort of pine, birch um, and uh, grassland. Um, uh, some of the bones have been scavenged by probably hyena or wolf. Um, but no evidence of human activity. Dating on these deposits puts them at a, around about 80 to 90,000 years ago. Um, there is a tiny little bit of contentious evidence for humans at this time. Most people would say, no, it's they're, they're not here. Um, Francis Wenban Smith and, and myself have published a site at Dartford down here. Um, uh, on the um, where the A2 crosses the M25. And when they remodeled the junction a few years ago, we were able to excavate some large trenches and here's one of them. Um, and, and it's this part of the trench that's, that's really important. Because we were able to dig such big trenches, we were able to look very closely for artifacts. And we found two artifacts, here you can see them, undoubtedly stone tools. Um, in these deposits dated between, we've got a date of 115,000 down here, which is the last interglacial when the hippos were in the Thames, and 88,000 about this time of our Royal Oak portal site. So we would argue that, that this is evidence for sporadic um, visitations by people um, somewhere around about 80 to 90,000 um, years ago, uh, perhaps the first people coming back into the Thames um, after the last um, interglacial. I'm now going to move rapidly um, to the end. Um, I've now jumped in time from 80,000 years ago to about 11 to 12,000 years ago and a couple of sites um, that we've worked upon that date to this very final phase of the Upper Paleolithic. The first was revealed again in work for the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Um, this is the launch chamber for the, the tunnel boring machine that bored the tunnel underneath the, the Thames. So the Thames is, is, is off, off this map here, it's, it's, it's up in this direction. We were able to drill a lot of boreholes and do some um, geophysics to allow us to, to understand the stratigraphy of the deposits beneath the ground. And, and what we were able to determine was that there were various gravel bodies buried beneath here and various peat units, again, detail not um, 
not needed. But we predicted up here on top of this um, higher gravel deposit, there might well be archaeology from um, the uh, latest uh, Paleolithic to the earliest Holocene uh, Mesolithic. Um, we were able to dig a coffer dam through here, and indeed, we recovered uh, flint artifacts. These are what we call long blades. Um, these are long blades of flint, um, although in this case, they're not very long blades, not in comparison to the long blades they get in, in, in sites such as uh, Belvoir in, in, in the Somme. But nonetheless, these are, are long blades of flint, which were used by the final Paleolithic people about um, 12,000, 12 and a half thousand years ago. Um, in the final cold snap before the Holocene um, started. Um, the other site, which has a very similar archaeology, historically for me, um, is interesting because this was one of the sites I cut my teeth on, uh, <clears throat> archaeologically speaking, um, when I worked for the DGLA in West London in 1988. Um, and this is in the Combe Valley here, an important uh, valley in the, the West London um, area that has produced uh, Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic archaeology for, for a very long time. And here's the excavations at Three Ways Wharf. You can see the test pits um, being dug, dug here to isolate uh, the distribution of the archaeology. Um, so those were the test pits you could see. And then we located a, a number of scatters of flint. Each one of these black dots is, is a flint or a bone um, in the what we call the area C scatter. There were other smaller scatters, area A and B. While most of this was Mesolithic and not the focus of this talk, there were um, long blades within the material. Here you can see the excavation in one meter squares of the fractured uh, bone and <laughs> flint, the, the bone associated with the long blades was reindeer bone, um, which further confirms its, its Paleolithic um, date. And here you can see some of the, uh, the long blades fitted together, refitted in, back into the cores. Um, this is a metatarsal of, of, of a reindeer from the site, and, and they were clearly um, butchered. So that's a rapid speed through a million years of history. What can we conclude? I think Paleolithic archaeology, since I've been a student and then um, into the, uh, the period now, has been through a golden period. We've had some fantastic sites being excavated, sites like Box Grove, sites like Haysborough, the work on the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. Um, we've been very lucky as, as a generation of archaeologists who are interested in, in the Paleolithic. We can't understand the landscape, uh, the, the Paleolithic, uh, without understanding the landscape and geology, it's it's it it, it is integral to um, the archaeology. Um, it's expensive to do, though. Um, it's very expensive to do. It's more expensive than most other forms of archaeology. Our understanding of the Paleolithic record has changed immensely over the last forty years. When I was a student, the, the, the time span at which we had for Paleolithic archaeology in this country was about 450,000 years. That was the oldest archaeology we had. We now have doubled that back to nearly a million years ago. We couldn't even dream about some of the things that ancient DNA are telling us, um, not so much in this country because we haven't got much bone, but elsewhere about our Paleolithic ancestors. So uh, the subject has changed beyond um, recognition. We're struggling though in some areas. We still are in the infancy of developing methods for locating sites. It's very hard to locate sites. Very few sites have actually been found through prospecting. Most that haven't come up in quarries have come up accidentally. Um, so we, we still need to get better at doing that. Today, there are a few opportunities to train new Paleolithic archaeologists. Sites like Boxgrove and the British Museum excavations are, are, are smaller than they had, or in Boxgrove's case, it's not happening. So um, I'm worried about where we train our future archaeologists. And the new planning laws that are, may come into operation may be harmful to the continued success of Paleolithic archaeology. We also need to be better at explaining our archaeology to, to the profession and, and beyond. Um, for most archaeologists, as I mentioned earlier, they don't understand the, the Paleolithic. It's 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 um, 
uh, something that really is um, not well known. Uh, and there aren't many of us doing Paleolithic archaeology. So we need to we need to broaden that. So there's lots to do um, in the future. Um, there are some exciting new projects in, in the offing. The Lower Thames Crossing, for good and bad, um, will provide a unique opportunity to look at a, a, a big part of the Thames record. And I think we're going to get some really interesting um, new sites and finds from there. There's work going on the Ebb Street Peninsula, which will further shed light on, on, on some of these issues. Um, things like the A12 road widening scheme in Essex um, are undoubtedly going to, to, to produce new um, Paleolithic sites. And I think that certainly the Lower Thames Crossing and the A12 are, are going to be Paleolithic projects on a scale not um, seen before. So, you know, watch this slot over the next five to ten years, and I think <clears throat> there'll be some new uh, things to report. Few references there, um, if people want them, um, and you'll be able to see those more easily um, on the, um, uh, the the video of this, which will be on the um, YouTube channel, I think. So, thank you very much, and any questions? <laughs>